Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I am glad to be back. Uh, it is January 12th, 2024, and we're going to jump right into some things happening as well in the city of Missoula. We get snow for the first time and actually sticking around this weekend as uh, temperatures are freezing cold out there. It's only going to get colder and then it's going to start getting a little bit warmer by the end of Martin Luther King Jr. weekends. Many schools are closed except for Missoula County schools within the city uh, area as well. So Flathead County, most of their schools have uh, closed. Uh, Lake County, most of their schools have been closed. Uh, Lincoln County, schools closed. Missoula County, it seems like uh, only Bonner School had a two hour delay. Um, and then Sealy Lake Elementary has a two hour delay as well. So most of the MCPS school kids will have to uh, attend school and you know just a little bit of a, um, a teaser as you can see kind of behind me in this poorly kind of a um, pictured uh, screenshot of my dash cam from my car is that I got this around three in the afternoon on Thursday and if you were driving around downtown Missoula area around three in the afternoon the other day you're gonna see something a little bit like this with very poor visibility going into, so this is around three in the afternoon. I was just driving around town doing some errands and whatnot, and I just got bombarded with a flurry of snow. It was so thick, I couldn't see the lights in the next uh, intersection. And then within probably, I would probably say no more than 15, 20 minutes, all the snow just kind of cleared up and it was clear skies for the rest of the day. And it was pretty nice. You know, this is the, around the time of magic hour. So I, uh, I was pretty, pretty outside. Um, after I was running some of my errands. So without further ado, uh, let's talk about some city council stuff because it's been quite a while since we even uh, dove into uh, city council meetings. So we're gonna go into that. Let me just bring up my notes. I know we had some time off from city council, like I said, and I took uh, off some time in accordance to the schedule. So uh, next Monday, since it is Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, Day, um, there will no, not be a city council meeting, but I will still be here next Friday to talk about what I'm going to be talking about today. So we're going to kick things off with uh, a concerned citizen who is worried that uh, 911 doesn't do enough for crimes that are in progress. Um, I'd like to bring to your attention an incident that occurred in my neighborhood on December 29th of 2023, an incident that has prompted me to address you tonight on that day. It, <sighs> Excuse me. On that day, my wife and I witnessed an act of potential vandalism involving a neighbor's vehicle and approximately two dozen severed chicken feet. In response, we dialed 911 seeking assistance and justice. However, what unfolded exposed a disheartening truth. Our current reporting system is ill-equipped to address uh, incidents outside our immediate property boundaries. Subsequent discussions today with uh, Donna Townsley, assistant manager of Missoula County 911, revealed the challenges associated with reporting incidents not directly tied to our property. The dispatcher's explanation that a formal report couldn't be filled due to the location of the incident was deeply troubling. The incident is particularly poignant in light of the encouragement we often receive from law enforcement to report anything suspicious that we see. It highlights a significant contradiction. Right. We are and so that was Nathan um, Stevens talking about how uh, his he was technically ignored for uh, what his 911 call was doing. So, you know, I've been covering community councils in many places, especially when it comes on the further kind of weird boundary lines between city and county. And a lot of times when it comes to law enforcement is that if there's a crime in progress, report it, make sure you have, uh, you know, it's, you know, they encourage cameras and anything to do with that as well. Uh, not to mention lock your cars that are on the street, keep your garage doors closed. Uh, a lot of crimes or vandalism is uh, all opportunistic kind of uh, timing. So a lot of times police officers will go into your community and tell you to make sure you lock up a lot of your possessions, especially lock up your cars. Don't leave anything in the back of the car that is more valuable than they're willing to break the window for. So that is one of the things that they'll most likely do. It is unfortunate, um, but this is just one of the many things uh, that you know, 911 can only go so far to do. And speaking of 911, uh, one of the homeless individuals uh, who uh, comes to city council uh, pr quite often, Clayton Shea, is a homeless man who also called 911 for an assault and he didn't get justice either. On the comments of the first caller, I just wanted to reflect back on a bit of my years with Johnson last year when uh, I called 911 because someone was 
bashing out five of my windows on the street right after assaulting me inside during lunch. So there's the assault. I walk away kindly. What do I get for it? But this person re follows me to the street, starts bashing out the windows there. 911 calls come, and they refuse to chase the fella because the car is not legally in my name. Now it's the same car that they ticketed me for public nuisance for when it was on Johnson Street two weeks earlier. They didn't have any problem ticketing me or refusing to help me move it or anything. All right, so there's a little taste of, of, of that going into it as well. Uh, people always uh, test boundaries to see how far they can get away with things without getting into trouble, and they tend to recoil when challenged, but if things are allowed to escalate situations like Clayton's becomes more commonplace. Uh, Silas uh, Tools Day, uh, talks about the uh, anti-capping ordinance and how he's lost some of his, uh, some of the folks that he's built a rapport over with over the years, and he uh, pleads with the council. No, it's not an easy issue, but I grew up in Missoula without a lot of means, not a lot of ways to help those people beyond a granola bar or maybe a coffee um, when I have a chance. And when you don't have money ways to help people who are struggling, you help them with little things and with community building and it 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 really it hurt to leave town for a bit and come back and see memorials for houseless people I know on the sidewalks knowing I wouldn't be able to talk to them again and that if we had been able to do better things as a city to help those people survive winters like this I might have been able to tell them about the travels that I had brainstormed with them before I left about their lives before they were houseless because they had visited those places too. So when you're considering your votes in this next month, if you pass these ordinances, you're taking away one of the few ways that people like me who don't have a lot of money actually have a way to try to support those people. And that is one of the uh, many uh, uh, folks that have come forward to talk to the city council about just you know showing some kindness to the homeless folks who people are struggling not to mention the fact that a lot of the people who are newly homeless are the ones that were struggling even long before the pandemic really kind of showed the cracks and uh, showed a lot of the issues moving forward with a lot of those folks as well. Um, and as we get into public hearings involving signage related to Russell and Lewis and Clark, this is uh, as this is within the city and also the State Board of Regents in regards to public schools. So there's a lot of red tape they have to get through just so they can get approval, which includes city council meetings. So Claire Blala, Claire Claire Loveless uh, from City Council from the city talks about uh, the signage in front of the building. Here is an image of an earlier non-illuminated reader board sign in the same location at Russell Elementary School. Russell Elementary School is replacing the sign in this picture with an electronic illuminated dynamic display sign. Lewis and Clark Elementary does not currently have a sign in the location of the new proposed sign. Just like Russell Elementary, they will be installing an electronic dynamic display sign. Here are images of where the proposed signs will be located. In both cases, the signs face residential zoning districts. Zoning code does not allow dynamic display signs to face residential districts. All right, and so this is more about like a, like an education about like, you know, like it's just the little things, but at the same time, it's like something that can, um, uh, you know, turn into something a little bit more. And you know how long it took just for like, things like, you know, you have county schools which are run through the state and then policies through the within the city limits and then all this kind of stuff that went through uh, just coming up with basic signage, not to mention these are LED signs and so they have to adhere to the uh, the facts that the, uh, the light has to be a certain uh, uh, light pollution so it does not affect the neighborhoods or like bleed in for additional light pollution. So it's kind of kooky it's just in the uh, idea of this. And so, you know, th this will be a sign that is lit up and will comply with the codes regarding residential light pollution and reflect non-invasive sign that pops but not overwhelms. And at the same time, it's a good way to, you know, a lot of schools when you're modernizing just have the signage to be able to change it because a lot of times a lot of the older schools, uh, old school way of doing things is to basically have those kind of like giant like letters that you just put up on a giant kind of a sign and whatnot. So it's uh, that's kind of what they're going on with that. But let's move on to a public hearing about zoning in the Orchard Homes area. And so this is a 24 major subdivision lot on three acres. So what they're planning on doing is uh, essentially uh, the original plan is that the old zoning had it at a higher rate 
but this zoning is going to lower it down just slightly a bit for the orchard homes as they're kind of building a little bit more density, but also trying to correlate it with the street and also the, with the neighborhood, even though it does not extend what the neighborhood outlook basically looks like, which the city kind of talked about this a couple of years ago on this. So Laura Stevens with the city talks a little bit more about that. So this is what she had to say. If annexed, it would be within the Two Rivers Neighborhood Council and City Council Ward 6. Property owners within 150 feet were sent mailed notices and no public comment has been received by staff at this time. The proposed Orchard Grove subdivision would result in 24 residential lots, which are proposed to have a mix of single detached houses and townhouse units. There are three existing residential duplex structures on site that will be converted into townhouse units. Uh, these are shown in light blue. Three other existing residential structures are proposed to be removed. Okay, and so this is just uh, one of the many things that they are planning to do with this particular area. Uh, and I remember in past meetings they had residents come and protest in terms of gentrification in originally suburban areas. The city moved to pass zoning laws at the time to reflect demand for affordable housing. This originally was meant to allow up to 11 units per acre, and this zoning would have the maximum cap about 8 per acre, hence the 24 units within those 3 acres that they're uh, uh, delineating a lot of that uh, construction and development or future development that's that's what this is zoning is all about not to mention annexation annexation as well so john dennert with i meg engineering they're they're talking about the plans and talk more about the site upon approval of the zoning annexation request so this is what you might expect from the site moving forward as lauren covered magnolia drive is the wooner street type that's being proposed within the development and you know it's it's an interesting street type by merit um, in that it's in the city's subdivision regulations, but but rarely gets implemented because it it really has to have the right components, the right circumstances for it to make sense um, from both the developer's side and the and the city's perspective. Um, you know, the, the namesake is that living street type that has to prioritize the shared space along with lower speeds, traffic calming design, um, and, and really is intended to improve that pedestrian, bicycle, and, and automobile safety. Okay, and so that was, that, and that's one of the other things they're doing with this rezoning, not only with the uh, future development of the site with townhouse and what developers want to do with creating those 24 units, but also utilizing the space to create a safer haven, and plus also installing a, um, calming circles, which is kind of like what you see behind me. It's kind of like a roundabout, except it's not really a roundabout. It doesn't. It's it's weird. It's like it it uh, like I I was um actually by uh, someone from the city when I said it's like oh that that roundabout on like it's like near Bonner. It's like no, it's called a uh, traffic calming circle. I'm like, okay, whatever, who cares? But yeah, that's that's kind of uh, that's what it's called essentially. So, uh, and of course the la um. You know, so improving the streets and creating framework for improving the neighborhood while also addressing needs in the area. The key term is living streets, streets, which he just mentioned, which was geared towards safety for bike ped and slowing down traffic in this area with that calming circle uh, uh, tidbit thrown in there as well. So a last bit of the public hearing involved a 7% increase in fees towards development permits. This usually goes hand in hand with um, um, inflation. And so the city is keeping up with inflation on this regard. Uh, they did raise it a couple, I, I believe last year, if not a year ago, the year before uh, to uh, help with the demand of developers to, to help keep up with their process. Because when they spend a little bit more money to the city for permitting, the city can hire new staff to be able to help the flow of the process. So Christian Hands uh, talks to the city a little bit more about the, the uh, reason behind the 7% uh, increase in building fees. The Development Services Division of CPDI is requesting an inflationary increase associated with the building division's building permit fees in the amount of 7%, mirroring other standard increases in service fees across the city. The increased request will be applied to all building, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, and demolition permit fees, as well as plan review fees, moving permits, reinspection fees, and reactivation fees. This increase is consistent with and in line with the recent City Council approved inflationary fee increases related to development services, zoning and land use application review fees, 
business licensing and permit fees, and public works and mobilities application and review fees. The City of Missoula has not enacted a fee increase related to building division fees in 12 years, like I stated earlier. All right, so this is a long time coming for the city of Missoula. And not all uh, developers are happy as one developer who comes forward, Gene Mostead with Mostead um, Construction, talks about the fees that are already impacting him in terms of construction costs, supply costs, and every other additional cost that's being squeezed out of uh, every uh, area as well and now the City Council is doing their thing and so this is what he had to say about that. I know that in my business um, we've noticed increased revenue based on our, our markups but it, a lot of it is just because of the increase in building costs. So I would think that the increase in the uh, building costs in the way they do their evaluations should have more than given them more uh, permit money to uh, um, deal with their budget and I think there's a case in point uh, when they're saying that they haven't raised any fees in 12 years um, there's a reason for that and that's because of that same scenario is they're already getting more fees based on the increased valuations so I don't know why they need another 7% because they've been getting a raise every year as the value of homes go up Yep. And so, you know, that's 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 a good argument as well. Um, one of the things that I've also heard from past meetings in terms of increasing the fees is that the last time the city created this uh, kind of like new fee schedule, they call it a fee schedule because every year they increase the fees on certain things like Parks and Rec. So we'll call this a fee schedule for this intensive purposes, which reflects inflation and all the costs, everything with that. And inflation also reflects uh, the amount of time needed for the city because I've heard from developers um, on city council meetings is that they have a tough time being able to uh, work with the city and trying to get things through because there's so many other developers competing for time within the city. So they came up with that plan a year or so ago to be able to increase the fees so they can hire more staff to be able to accommodate more developers to develop and streamline those uh, processes. I um, mean, Montana State created a lot of the framework for uh, streamlined processes for affordable housing. I think it was up to like 15 different standards that they can utilize from. But this also goes in um, to the idea that, you know, with the inflationary costs, who knows, like, you know, it's the idea is like, I don't know if this is the seven percent is going to like hire new people or make them work faster, but you know the the original framework was the point was to uh, work better with a lot of these uh, developers, and I guess the seven percent is what the city believes that will be able to help more developers in less amount of time. Because when you're trying to develop a property, if you're delayed a day, a month, a year, it starts adding up in price with tens to $100,000 projects, it's it's ridiculous how expensive developing and construction can be, especially if it's delayed. All right, other items include new business related to old business is, uh, actually we're gonna skip that. Th there's no point in that right now. Uh, we're gonna jump right ahead. We're gonna talk about public safety and health and their pre-disaster preparation. And of course, prior to local adoption, FEMA approves and requires uh, plans in order to be eligible for certain federal disaster assistance and hazardous um, mitigation funding. And so Adrian Beck talks a little bit more about that in terms of how the, why the city should be doing this. Every jurisdiction is required to have one if we want to be eligible for FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, mitigation funding, uh, both uh, outside of a disaster as well as post-disaster. So uh, when a presidential disaster is declared, uh, most recently uh, in Missoula, that was in 2018 for the flooding event that we encountered. We are eligible for what they call public assistance, actually, I stand corrected. The most recent one was COVID, but everyone knows that one, right? Um, we're eligible for what they call public assistance, which is a way for us to repair public infrastructure and or pay for the response to that said emergency uh, from a local government standpoint. Uh, that public assistance comes by way of grants back from FEMA, um, normally in a 75-25 cost share uh, match, where locally we're responsible for that 25%. Uh, sometimes that 25% is picked up by the state of Montana. Uh, All right, so there's a little bit of a, 
background on you know how the money works and everything like that but you know this is just emergency money and making sure that you know cities and states are kind of up to code and you know doing their due diligence to make sure that uh, the cities are safe and not to mention uh, they have a adequate response to any future disasters moving forward. Um, so uh, up next, we actually are moving over to climate conservation and parks. Um, this is what they're going to be covering, the Clark Fork River access points from Madison Bridge all the way to Karis Park and trying to improve the um, basically just the area to actually get entry and exit points from the river, especially during the high peak season during the summer when a lot of people are floating down the river. So, and since 2014, Morgan Valiant with Open Space Programs talks about the site that is getting real new Karis Park kind of vibes to it. Uh, so without further ado, this is what he had to say. Really are talking about building an intuitive system of downtown river access points to um, not only provide recreational use uh, or improve recreational use, uh, but also to protect the resources that we really value uh, from the Clark Fork River. And uh, Clark Fork River through town is, it's tough. Anytime a river flows to an urban area, it's usually largely highly confined and developed uh, and impacted. And so we as a community, uh, being a river community, really value those riparian areas that run through town no matter how small they are, uh, so that we can provide good wildlife habitat, um, water quality, and then also these recreational opportunities. Thank you. All right, and so one of the big things, if you take a closer look at some of the presentation right here, is that this is um, going to be a more access for ADA accessibility from uh, Karis Park directly, with some places in um, as you can see, some erosion, you know, people coming in and out of the berms and the levees that were built. It's, it gets pretty, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of wear and tear and there's going to be, and, they're gonna, and they talk quite a bit about the wear and tear uh, on some of the sites. And as you can see, some of the image, they do plan on um, um, making easy access points for all abilities. One of the biggest takeaways from the rendering they presented in conjunction with Karis Park, restoration and elimination of the big old hill is a, one of their a many open space projects beyond acquiring space, but using these resources to become stewards and protectors of public space on par with national parks. Morgan uh, Valiant talks about the issues for those using the river and uh, this is what he has to say. Uh, we really wanted to understand how people were using the Clark Fork River. And I started to become really concerned uh, about the river use patterns I was seeing uh, in 2012. I used to bike to work. I lived uh, at a different, a different location and I biked this stretch every day and started to see all these river created loss of stream bank vegetation and river uh, user access points for people to get to the river. Uh, a large community effort came together, uh, which eventually grew into a, a collaborative called the Three Rivers Collaborative. Uh, and the Clark Fork uh, Coalition, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and the City of Missoula in 2018 did a pretty comprehensive river study. And All right, so within this study, they determined that there were well over 2,000 floaters uh, a day which uh, essentially is 50 uh, floaters per hour with a majority of single users, you know, just people on inner tubes and that's good. River access the f thus far as non-traditional access from the area that requires folks to leave the river in opportune locations. The studies show that 90 of those access points uh, which resulted in erosion in the majority of the project is to encourage better access through development access and leveraging extra money for a restoration project that is 10 years overdue. This has been something on uh, Morgan Valiant's mind for over 10 years and he's definitely worried about some of the erosion, the wear and tear and people coming in and out of the river from who knows where, but to be able to have these kind of access points to be able to uh, move this forward is their ultimate goal. And so we actually move over to Zach Covington with Open Space, who talks more about their group and some of the things that they do. So these projects, as Morgan mentioned, you know, are, are usually in the form of acquisition or, or a donation, uh, things like that. But, but this is unique in that it's a uh, capital improvement project. And so um, we'll touch on some details of that a little bit later. But generally, I just wanted to kind of go over that we do look uh, at open space bond objectives per the 2018 bond. We look at um, a number of other uh, documents and make sure to kind of go through those with a fine tooth comb to make sure that these projects are aligning with, with those goals and objectives. So this project uh, uh, 
definitely provides access to water and land, as uh, Morgan mentioned. Uh, it conserves fish and wildlife habitat, conserves rivers, lakes, and streams, uh, definitely protects scenic views and improves scenic views. The last one there in the open space bond is makes improvements to lands acquired or designated as open space that are accessible to the public. All right, and so just to kind of give you a little bit more retrospect of uh, background of how open space have been using some of their funding to help leverage the revitalization of public uh, space and public utilities was the uh, Rattlesnake Dam removal. That was a big undertaking in, in conjunction with private public partnerships, which apparently I heard that they didn't, uh, that it was uh, awarded grants and money, so none of the tax money actually went into it. Um, for the uh, removal of the rattlesnake dam, so it's it's interesting how like you know like when you have these kind of things for common good, you have a lot of people who are involved with this particular portion of it, and so this big major thing with the open space bond money that they're going to be utilizing is that they're asking for no more than one million dollars to move towards this process, and this money is the money that's called open space bond money, the same money that they used, yes, sure, to uh, buy the Marshall Mountain. Um, in conjunction with the county, but this one is a little bit more central towards downtown uh, Missoula, uh, as we are River City, and just to help mitigate erosion by encouraging people to move forward on this. So Nathan McLeod, Parks and Rec, talk more about the aim for this site um, in the future. The idea of this is to really create and improve um, a system of sustainable public access to and from the river for people of all backgrounds and all abilities and that it's the goal, primary goal is to protect water quality, wildlife habitat, recreational opportunities, scenic views, vistas, and provide climate and re resiliency benefits. All right, and so that was just a little excerpt from it. Uh, these are, like I said, these are all excerpts and just kind of getting little quotes from here and there. And so another way uh, uh, they plan on discouraging people from uh, electing to leave the river any time is to uh, the placement of trash, uh, uh, access to toilets, they had images of wear and tear on trails around the river uh, access resulting in a multitude of mini landslides, or for lack of a better term. It's not one person's fault. It is a collective nature of these issues that were brought up over the last 10, 20 years. Um, um, Nathan, in particular, talks more about the access on the other side of the river near, near Tool, where it already has public restrooms off the place of, of Milwaukee Trail and also talks a little bit more about some of the erosion and some of the area in that too. So here is. These images show uh, Tool Park. So the image on the right is an early concept from that 2015 study. Um, this is at the Tool Park restroom adjacent to the native prairie right on the Milwaukee Trail. This is one of the heaviest used places for people to take out, again, because of proximity to the bathroom, trash cans, free parking. It is fairly accessible. There actually is an ADA accessible route from the end of 4th Street onto the Milwaukee Trail in this location. This concept's older, um, so it's been kind of uh, tailored a little bit so that it's not quite as robust or large as what's shown in this image, but essentially it's providing access to an existing low water beach um, and then terracing with rocks the bank so that it's not gonna erode into the Milwaukee Trail. Yep, and so that was the uh, that was, that's just one of the uh, concepts that they have going on there. Besides what they're doing, um, and, you know, overall ramps for people to get access points to those who cannot step down. Karis Bar also has boulders that were built up into levees while the Army Corps of Engineers built it up, which resulted in the creation of Karis Park because they used to be all underwater, folks, all the way to uh, the Wilma Theater. People could just throw out their trash into the river. The good old days where you didn't care about the environment as much. Oof. Pretty, sorry, uh, I, went, I went a little too far with that, but uh, yeah, but you care about the environment. You know, it's like, you know, it, it stacks up. But regardless of that, uh, this whole ticket price is looking to be about $2,775,304 is the ticket price for the river restoration and development projects to prevent future erosion and more money to be thrown at it rather than a trail being threatened by erosion. Half of the money is coming from the EDA Economic Development uh, Administration. Open space bond money, which I to told you was uh, not to exceed $1 million, was, the, was, was what this meeting was about. Uh, living next to a river ain't cheap and making sure properties and infrastructures last. This is a multi-prong approach to this with plenty of 
public-private investment in this particular area. Unfortunately, this will not address the max wave. So far, they will move forward with this process as they begins to set a public hearing for the million dollar open space edition. So um, if you want to learn more about your city of Missoula, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website where you can get engaged uh, with everything that's happening here as well. You know, it says right here with a new thing with the shelters weather uh, is preparing for uh, life threatening weather as it is throughout this weekend. If you see a person on the street wandering around or if you feel as though that they're homeless and uh, make sure that they uh, have a warm place to stay. Um, Johnson Street is a good example. Sovereign Hope Church is another good example because they do the uh, Sovereign Hope Rescue Mission, which is those uh, uh, temporary safe outdoor space uh, in conjunction with United Way of Missoula using some of that ARPA money that's going to last until 2025. They got some of that um, temporary housing structures outside just uh, up uh, Broadway towards the Missoula County Jail. Uh, <coughs> so uh, that's where you can learn more information. I actually have uh, a bunch of uh, videos for you guys uh, featuring all of MCAT's uh, new programming that's going to be airing on MCAT. Um, also, this is all available on our YouTube page, MCAT TV Missoula, and we are also announcing that we are going to launch our new uh, spring break camp for kids. It's a media camp for kids age 8 to 14, and uh, it's going to be a, a fun time. So. Here's this, and when I come back, we're going to talk about some movies. That's so cool! Why is he the only one that gets a car? Nobody else does. I have a magic shopping cart. I can fix that for you if you want. Ow, there's only one magical shopping cart in the world. I might have another, but it will cost you your soul. All right. I'll meet you outside in one hour. Don't be late. You're really, you're really intense about flying. This cart is more than just a cart. It's made of dreams. looking at it, like flipping it on its head a little bit, because we often think about trauma coming from the presence of fire. And in this case, the trauma came from the absence of fire. And I think that's, it's really important to sort of hold those two things together and to recognize that they're not mutually exclusive, um, that they can both be true. And that, you know, cultural burning is not a thing of the past that indigenous communities, you know, used to do, but don't anymore, but that it's still like this really important part of uh, of the culture and lifestyle for a lot of communities.
I have defeated the enemies of nature. I have come here to serve you. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. Kicking things off is Mean Girls, again. Uh, but this time they are doing uh, the original movie again, but this time it's a musical. Okay, let's jump right in. Uh, do, 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 do. No need that. All right. After 20 years and a semi-successful run on Broadway as a musical, uh, the singing version gets a movie adaptation with a new actor. So. The musical is an adaptation of the movie, and this movie is an adaptation of the musical, which was an adaptation of the movie. So, boom, you got the same story, you got the same actors. Um, well, mostly just Tina Fey and uh, Tim Meadows, uh, end of list. Uh, we are welcomed with uh, young faces breaking into Hollywood as the new girls who were born into perform on Broadway, but decided, hey, let's give this film a chance since, hey, if I was in the play, I deserve to be in this movie. And so, youth into this very popular franchise, which will get milked until all the almonds have been used in all those Frappuccinos. Uh, I watched the Mean Girls sequel, and I watched about 20 minutes before I was like, I'm leaving. So they actually made a direct-to-DVD uh, uh, sequel uh, when they still did back-to-DVD. So up next, we got an old man who beats up the young people who are stealing money from old people. So Jason Statham picks up a secret undercover badass who fights for the little guy. And in this movie, he's taking on internet scammers, uh, fight for the boomers and for the people of the world who take the first bit of information and open their wallets thinking that they're saving themselves only to get scammed. Jason Thaisdem comes into this generic named guy who fights back only to open a can of worms and a whole bunch of whoop ass uh, to combat the people who stole all the people's retirement money. This movie is revenge porn for people who've been scammed before by telemarketers. Um, the Book of Clarence. Do you like the Jesus? Well, enjoy a year one style parody about a group of black men who pretend to be messiahs to get money for themselves. This movie really gives a sorry to bother you vibe and Donald Glover's Atlanta vibes when you have a cast of characters who deal with systems of oppression in comedic subtle ways when they make these comedies, they point out the absurd and expect the viewer to get it. Not all movies are for everyone. Most likely he actually learns to be a good person by pretending to be a messiah and then he dies as a martyr or something like that. I don't know, it's basically around the same time. They make this movie uh, in conjunction with the timing of which Jesus was doing his stuff. So. Uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting how it uh, turns out in the end. So those are the movies that are coming out this weekend. Um, up next, we have a uh, dub and stuff for you guys from the 1940 movie, 1940 serials, The Shadow. So who knows, but The Shadow knows. So here's dub and stuff. Boy, I tell you, this is probably going to be one of the hardest cases I've ever had to deal with. You know, I'm tired of hearing about your scar for the 30th time. Can you find out where this came from? Do you actually think you can return it without a receipt? Do you think that you can just pick this up and look at it? Oh, look, the receipt. Huh, see? Well, this only kind of tells me the size, but... Oh, they're not Levi's? That's a brand, not the Fine. store. I guess I'll go take it over to Lab Guy, and he can now figure it out for us. Ugh, this isn't a proper use of police time, but yeah, who cares? Let's murder solve themselves. <laughs> You're always like, science this and science that. Why don't you science away this argument? Hey, I took the train, which you know takes longer to get here, and it was your idea for me to take public transportation. I don't really like seeing you like this. I'm going to stand over here. Whoa, hello there, chaps. Uh, huh, did you solve the uh, cure for cancer yet? Oh no, I want to make... Well, then you better steal from the Germans, because look over here. I just found out that you don't need a patent to steal from the Germans. Hmm, that doesn't sound right. Oh. Oh, hey guys, what's going on? Yeah, let's talk later about this German thing. We're here for important police matter. Which DNA evidence do you want me to fake this time, officer? Well, this time I'm going to ask you to do some real police work. This scarf here, we're trying to figure out where it came from. Well, you're kind of uh, underutilizing police resource for this stuff, but sure, why not? Ugh. Oh, thanks guys for waiting for four hours, but here are the results. 
let's see here, wool, cotton, and a couple of the things that I don't recognize, like pleather? What does that mean? What does pleather mean? Well, pleather is leather, but it doesn't kill cows. What's this part about being skinny jeans? What does that actually mean? It's a kind of fashion where it looks like long johns, but made of jeans material. Tighten the thighs, loosen and the crotch. And there's one place to get those. Hot, hot, hot oh, topic. Hot, hot, to- hot topic. Oh, and also in the skinny jeans, there was this crucifix, kind of like in a medallion in the form of a keychain. Oh, but why is it like in a pentagram? Oh, yes. The kids like their harmless fun. Well, it looks like I'm going to Spokane, Washington to solve this case. Thanks, Professor. I really appreciate it. guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some things that are happening in and around the city of Missoula for your weekend. Um, like always, Lifelong Learning Center is starting uh, beginning French for folks starting as early as 9 a.m. this morning, but they have plenty of these other classes as well. Um, it's not just a, a, a weekly thing, but it's a lot of a uh, opportunities for a lot of adults to get some additional education to get certified in all sorts of different fields from um, GED, metal smithing and all, all and more. Uh, of course many of those higher trade skills do require some um, apprenticeships and things beyond that but this is a great starting point for people especially people who uh, didn't graduate from high school and need uh, access to uh, lessons for GED prep and more. Uh, and of course uh, um, you know it is cold, snowy outside, and I'm assuming, you know, you want to stay active, you don't want to go outside, but there's a plenty of indoor activity ac- uh, places here in town. I'll give you the rundown, Mismo, Mismo Gymnastics, Roots Acker Sports Center, YMCA, just to name a few. I can mention the Valentine Center, which they usually do a lot of the indoor dodgeball and soccer arena. Um, they also have that um, Get Air trampoline uh, place, which used to be called the Flying Squirrel. So those are some of the ideas of some indoor recreation, and we must not forget Forget about the Parks and Rec's uh, indoor swimming uh, pool, Kearns Aquatic Center. So if you want to stay active, but also don't want to uh, go outside, those are the perfect venues for you moving forward. So um, as always, every Friday at 1030, Tiny Tales and Storytime here at the Missoula Public Library. Lunch at the Senior Center, Missoula Senior Center, starting at 1130 a.m. Back here at the library, Yarns and Watercolor on the fourth floor of the Public Library. Um, also inside the MCAT studio, we'll be going to be wrapping up the Black Hole Week around uh, 5 o'clock today. And, you know, it's basically uh, the whole studio has been turned into a... Uh, exhibit for Spectrum Discovery Center talking about Stephen Hawking's Black Hole Week. Um, dinner services at the Pavarella Center tonight starting at 5 p.m. They host lunches and dinners to help folks struggling to get food during these hard times. Mizzou, uh, also, the Missoula Food Bank is open most days starting at 10.30 a.m. for folks on e- any economic scale to partake in federally funded food aid. Um, also, Moons of the Solar System, the University of Montana, and uh, in conjunction with Payne Family Native American Center, uh, David Rodriguez for an in-depth look at the moons of our solar system. Uh, David is a senior at the University of Montana, and they're excited to feature his first public planetarium show. And that starts at 5.30 tonight um, as we get into the late night. Uh, music scene. If you want to jump on board, uh, Cranky Sam Public House is going to be uh, ha- hosting uh, Jordan Smith. We'll be playing some acoustic music. Multi genre at the Old Post featuring uh, Tom Suzanne. Um, Break out your rocks and socks uh, and dancing shoes. Monks is doing a rock show starting at 7 p.m. Uh, Union Club is, do- uh, is hosting uh, Cash for Junkers. Uh, that, that band is a jam band. Uh, Mikey Lyon at the Top House is going to be playing some electronic music, wrapping up your Saturday at 10 p. Uh, wrapping up your Friday at 10 p.m. Now, as we jump into Saturday, you have your supplement supplemental farmers market, which is called the Winter Market in the Southgate Mall. Uh, Orchard Homes will probably be launching theirs sometime soon within the next month or two, um, and uh, we'll be able to enjoy all these uh, market type stuff from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this is happening cur- um, at the Southgate Mall every Saturday up until May when they start launching up the regular. Uh, Farmers Market outside in the downtown Missoula area. Uh, Missoula Art Museum is doing a museum tour. They do it every single Saturday starting at 11 a.m. They're also uh, hosting um, Traveler's Rest. Uh, Lauren Flynn is going to be at the Traveler's Rest State Park hosting an event starting at 11 a.m. This is in Lolo, so it might be an interesting drive. They might just do it online. Sometimes they do a uh, stream, and you can find out the link through the Traveler's Rest uh, website as well. So Saturday, free family workshop. Montana remembered with Sasha Barrett. 
uh, Museum Art Museum. Uh, you know, if you go there for the tour at 11, you can stick around and enjoy ceramic artist Sasha Barrett in the workshop focused on an exhibition, Joanne, uh, Joanne uh, Daly, Montana Remembered, on view through uh, January 20th, 2023. Barrett will also lead participants through an ex exhibition, then guide in creating art. This one event is that I'm actually sad I missed this one. Um, MCAT Saturday drop-ins starting at 1 p.m. Kids get to do some stop animation. It's a great stop and workshop for a lot of kids who want to learn to edit, add voiceovers, and stuff like that. Um, and also, it's a great way to uh, sell our uh, summer and winter and spring camps. Uh, and then as we jump ahead to your Saturday evening, the Gravy Lady is going to be playing some folk music at Imagination Brewing Company starting at 6 p.m. The Wilma Theater is doing like a double take with uh, classic uh, albums live featuring blues music. Uh, Rumors is going to be playing some folk music both at 7 p.m. in conjunction with each other at the Wilma Theater. Uh, Baroque. In the new year, uh, the classical music of the church near the University of Montana campus that the UCC Missoula prepared to be captivated by uh, Alessandro Scaleri's Seven Are Con Tromba, an extraordinary display of the Baroque uh, trumpet artistry of Brendan McGlynn, McGlynn a principal trumpet for the Missoula Symphony. And so this intimate uh, concert offers a rare opportunity to witness Brandon, uh, Brendan's uh, virtuosity up close. So. Ice Cream Cometh, a uh, cold winter's drag soiree. So the uh, ISCM, oh, oh, ISCSM, otherwise known as the Imperial Sovereign Court of the State of Montana, works to educate and advocate for LGBTIQ community with promoting social tolerance through the production and in, um, in enactment of drag performances. And this is going to be hosted, I believe this is going to be at, uh, well, I, I did not write this down, but I believe it's going to be at the ZAC, but I should double check. Um, one second. Before I go back to that, I'm going to wrap up with uh, karaoke at the Westside Lane start at 9 p.m. Union Club is going to be hosting the Benevolence at Union Club. They usually play a lot of jam bands, people, things to get your toe tap in at the Union Club. And then Chris Moon is going to is featured every Saturday playing some DJ music at the Bandlander every single Saturday. So, uh, like I said before, the the drag show, which I I guess I didn't see uh, where where it was, is going to be at the Zootown Arts Community Center, of course. That's, that was my first guess, but I wanted to uh, make sure it was correct. So that is what's happening in and around the city of Missoula this weekend. But also I wanted to mention that, uh, you know, Monday is Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Day. And so there's gonna be a lot of different kinds of services happening. They usually, we usually have, uh, MCAT usually records it annually uh, over at the uh, uh, St. Francis Church. I wanted to double check as well, just to make sure that I'm Mm. Just give me a second. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, hmm. That's weird. MissoulaEvents.net didn't post it currently. Um, let's say MLK uh, Missoula. Let's see, if there's okay. MLK celebration. It's going to be on the 15th, 3:15 p.m. at the Memorial Rose Garden Park in Missoula. Folks will march to Rose Park to. Um, let's say they usually go from Rose Park. Sorry about this. They do this every year, but it's St. Anthony um, at 345. And if you want to go for the march, they start at Rose Park and they march on down to the uh, thing. It starts at 315. And they do this every single year in the uh, Missoula area. Um, so you guys can check that out. And you can find them on their Facebook page, um, Missoula MLK Junior Day Community Celebration. So. That's kind of what's happening with that. Uh, let's jump right in into some news as well. Um, I usually kind of, like, I used to start off with the news, but I'm kind of going to end the news just because it's probably my least um, interested uh, segment in my own opinion. So I want to kind of end <laughs> on a low note. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, uh, but it is, there we do have some sad news coming out of the UC, uh, NCAA as the University of Montana Grizzlies lost their battle with uh, South Dakota State Jackrabbits uh, with, uh, with only three points against South Dakota's 23-point victory. The beginning of the third quarter didn't see the Grizz overtake South Dakota, but the opposite. Um, of course, I've always known the Grizzly football team to be a second-half team, but as soon as South Dakota uh, ran, ran away with it with 16 uh points in the third quarter alone it was pretty much uh the end of the grizzly football um you know i was there last time grizz was this close to a national championship against the richmond spires out of chattanooga tennessee circa 2008 isn't that crazy and this is when the grizz had no loss record and they 
they choked. It's, you know, it just, you know, it just happens. It just, you know, I, you know, I can't speak for the Grizzlies. I, all I can really speak is for what I've seen and my history of it as well. So it's too bad, but you know, better luck next year, boys. Uh, Missoula got a new parking commissioner director for Christmas. So this is something that's kind of old news, but we're kind of getting out of it because we got a, a couple new city council members, a couple new uh, boards and stuff like that. Um, uh, we had, uh, the president and vice president of the city council, they elected some new people to uh, uh, foster in that. A Amber Sherrill, probably know, uh, she's one of the uh, city council members. She's the president. Merta Becerra will be vice president of city council. And they, they kind of act as the overseers of city council uh, when the mayor is not in attendance. So that's kind of what's going on with that. So uh, speaking, of, going back over the downtown parking commission, Jody Pilgrim, who has already been working for the parking commission for eight years, is will be helming the parking commission as a commissioner, as folks at the city, uh, Aaron Wilson sells the public on single lanes for traffic coming from Higgins, starting at Brooks through the bridge and improving the corridor and going northbound through downtown, while also potentially sacrificing some of the parking as well. Uh, this job will go into full access future parking in the development of the Riverfront Triangle and the changes to Fort and Main Street as Missoula pursues two ways lanes rather than the double threat as the city calls their one way uh, roads that have more than one lane. So changes on the horizon and parking is one of those things that is that is, has to be addressed for those uh, needing to work downtown. Uh, you know, density is yet another issue going into the winter plan and following by spring development and construction. The Gallatin County judge ordered a pause on state laws that allowed for more densities. And this is part of, it, uh, of the Montana's against irresponsible uh, densification asked District Court Judge Michael Salvagni to issue a, pre a preliminary injunction against two bills that were scheduled to go in effect on Monday. Um, many of these bills included um, overlays of affordable housing that the city of Missoula updated their zoning code to reflect these new additions. However, the growing concerns of gentrification disguised as affordable housing has resulted in the request. The court order read, uh, quote, the effort by the Montana legislature to write an entirely new review and approve verbal regime for zoning subdivision and annexation may result may, uh, may have resulted in pervasive uh, uh, arbitrary arbitrationness uh, sorry I, I totally butchered that but which runs afoul of both the equal protection and the due process clauses of the Montana Constitution end quote so they're going in strong on that one so another story coming out of Montana is our own uh, Lily Gladstone out of uh, Browning, Montana, the Blackfeet Reservation. Uh, she won a Golden Globe, and she, and it, which is pretty much on track of winning an Oscar. So a lot of times when you win a Golden Globe, it's pretty much like you probably would win an Oscar, but that's always when they have the great upsets for that as well. So the last time a Montanan won a, um, uh, an Oscar was uh, the 1953 film in a leading role from Gary Cooper, who was born in Helena. Of course, you know, everyone who likes to uh, say J.K. Simmons is part of our community. He went to the University of Montana. He was born in Minnesota. And the same thing even with David Lynch. He was born in Missoula, stayed for two months, and then moved to Idaho and was, uh, was pretty much raised there. So forget about that. The only person, uh, Gary Cooper, was the only few people who were born here aside from Lily Gladstone. So I don't know why I'm going into this whole like, they weren't, they're not true Montanans and that kind of thing, but that's, that, that's besides the point. Um, and of course, all, all the details aside, Killer of the Flower Moon covered the Osong tribe as they were targeted by wet settlers in the 1920s for their wealth in an oil boom town. And fun fact, she was also in uh, John Niles independent uh, film, uh, Saving for the Day, a movie that premiered a year or so ago here in the, the city of Missoula. She was, uh, she acted in it, I believe, like almost like 10 plus years ago when he was working on this film for a, a, a long time. So there's some interesting six degrees of separation. And Lily Gladstone had a great documentary, and I suggest you uh, watch a video kind of detailing her visit back to Browning. She lives in Missoula, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting. And, you know, um, Gladstone also worked with the Song Nation in Oklahoma uh, near Tulsa to learn the language and was awarded an honorary member of their tribe for her portrayal. Up next, we uh, have some, the, uh, there was also a census for population growth in 2023. So this is part of the uh, Montana Independent uh, uh, Reporter. Uh, so far, the year saw less than 10,000 people move to the state. And as of 2023, the federal demographic estimated about Montana had 1.1 uh, 
million, actually 1,132,800 residents. Uh, that was a 9,900 more than the year prior or a 0.9% increase uh, just in the year. Uh, of course, prior year in 22 saw 19,000 people from um, just the 2022 census and growth has slowed down and overall the number of people who have moved to Montana since 2020 was about 48,000 new people, which uh, the Montana Independent Free Press mentioned that was the size of Bozeman. And of course, you can't just have a, a, a whole bunch of new people who move here without take into account how much housing was developed over that time. So imagine this, we had 48,000 new people come to the state of Montana and then housing stock increased by 13,000, which according to the math, uh, one home for every 3.7 residents of population growth. Another major development happening in Missoula is the Grand Strands in the Missoula Fairgrounds with ticket price of $5 million. Through private public partnership with the county, this will join the M Missoula Butterfly House as their groups as new attractions for folks to use the fair and we will be able to open the uh, Klaus Bauer Arena by July, just in time for the Western Montana State Fair. This is the only tip of the iceberg as Midtown um, Missoula from Rose Park to Reserve Street up through the Southgate Mall will see major changes in the area for, area for development and infrastructure, which also includes a corridor for the bus, uh, so like a bus lane. So a single bus lane that would uh, drive right in the center of Brook Street from Rose Park all the way to Reserve, all the way pretty much up to Reserve. Um, I don't know how far it's going to go, but essentially that's what they want to do is like a big portion of that is going to be put there and also with improvements with everything. So there's a lot of things happening out there like that. And speaking of Brooks, Liquid Planet will take over the former Denny's that closed that year. This will be their seventh location of Liquid Planet that had the logo. They have a lot of those little kind of shops and those kind of uh, office buildings and places, the hospital, the courthouse and stuff like that. So uh, they'll be serving up breakfast and their typical liquid selection. They've made a staple in the downtown Missoula area for many years. Although I stopped going there since they moved to their early location. Um, uh, from Higgins to the former Zootown Brew. Um, it's basically on the same block, but just, it's off Broadway instead. Um, you know, speaking of businesses, the cafe inside the Missoula Public Library is accepting bids. And if you want to do a startup cafe, it's a prime location within the library and a regularly attended flow of people. Uh, this whole MCAT thing doesn't work out. Maybe I'll start my own business. But, you know, I'm, not, I'm only mentioning it because, you know, I'm kind of begging someone to open a cafe so I don't have to walk outside of the building to get my stuff and then come back here, which isn't the worst thing in the world, but I would like to just like not, not have to be away from the desk for that long to be able to get it. But you know, laziness, right? Uh, but you know, if you wanna uh, uh, submit, you just look up to uh, Missoula County bids and proposals and you'll be able to find this as uh, under the MPL Cafe um, um, keyword. So MPL Cafe as the keyword, you won't, you won't be able to miss it. So um, let's see, um, we do have a little bit, uh, we don't have too much time. So I'm gonna wrap this up. It's been an interesting uh, um, New Year's for sure. It already feels like um, the end of January, even though it's just uh, kind of getting started. So uh, without further ado, I wanna thank you guys for joining me this morning and for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph.